ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, thank you very much for joining us today on what I hope will be a lively and informative discussion on the promises, but also the pitfalls and the pressures that are involved in um, investing in the high growth markets or emerging markets, as apparently they used to be called, but that is now unfashionable. Um, last night, if, uh, for those of you who were present at the dinner, you'll have heard the German foreign minister extolling the virtues of the breakneck uh, pace of growth in the world's high growth markets. Um, and also saying that, at, especially at a time like this, during a recession in Europe, we have a unique opportunity and our companies have a unique opportunity to partner up with what he called the rising stars to stay relevant. Now, of course, Investing in the world's emerging markets um, does deliver rewards, but it also presents significant risks, responsibilities, and alongside that goes the pressure for reform as well, and political upheaval, etc. Um, as such, companies that are looking for growth in these markets, they need to do their due diligence, and they need to balance out these kind of forces alongside what is sometimes relentless pressure for growth from shareholders. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce our panelists today. As you can see on my left here, we have Arif Nakvi from the Abraj Group, CEO and also founder of the Abraj Group. So um, he's obviously somebody who's extremely adept at telling us about the, uh, the space of emerging markets. He's also got great uh, experience as a veteran investor in the emerging markets world. But also from a corporate side, we have uh, um, Mr. Nagib Sawiris, uh, the chairman of Arascom Telecom. And um, Jonathan Oppenheimer over there, last but not least on the other side of the panel, will be bringing us the commodities aspect as well, because that is key. And obviously, coming from South Africa, that's the latest member of the BRICS club. Um, before we get started, I would also like to ask the audience to vote on two questions today. We'll start out with the first, and it is, would you invest in Arab Spring afflicted countries today? So I'd like to ask you to vote on that. We'll bring out the uh, results of that in a moment's time. In the meantime, we'll start with you, Arif. You've been investing in the emerging market space for many, many years, um, <laughs> without making you feel Wait, I need to see this. Uh, we'll come to that in Yo. a second. <laughs> um, it's a great audience. <laughs> that, that, is a yeah, that is an almost overwhelmingly yes vote. Let's see whether it changes in a minute's time based on what you have to say. But you've been investing in the world's emerging markets for many times. Why, why would you say that the, the reward overrides the risks? So... Look, I, uh, the first session that I sat through, the earlier one on global capitalism, the room was dark. Everybody was talking about the problems and issues. And I thought to myself, there must be something cheerful in this world, and that's what I've come to talk to you about. Because the first thing that I'm going to disagree with you about is this, what I consider, and forgive me for saying so, slightly patronizing term that says emerging markets. We've emerged. These markets exist. And these markets are going to drive and are going to be responsible for global growth in the coming years and decades. And that's why I and a lot of investors in those markets call them global growth markets. Because two thirds of global growth is gonna come from these markets and the opportunity that exists there is actually very large. Now of course there are pitfalls and you referred to risk. But being slightly provocative, you know, when uh, we look at financial models in the financial services industry and we see, decide what do we invest in and what do we not. There's always a premium that is attached to uh, investing in emerging markets or global growth markets. So there, there is a risk premium that's attached. But when risk came, it came from the heart of Wall Street. It came from within the endemic system, but nobody did anything to resolve the risk premiums that were being attracted by these so-called markets, which in turn were becoming more and more driving the global economic landscape. So in my opinion, when we sit and compare what's happening there with what's happening in the rest of the world, the driving force of the global economy, two thirds of global growth, and a whole series of trends that I can talk about that we see very clearly, the demographic dividend of the youth population, the consumer classes, urbanization, all of these things that in turn are going to drive not just the global economy, but prosperity in these markets. Nagib Sariris, you occupy a very, very interesting space in the sense that you're at the helm of large corporations that are involved in the emerging markets. Actually, they're, they're hugely important corporations in the emerging markets, like Arascom, Telecom. But also, um, 
you're an emerging market player that has also invested in Europe, making major acquisitions here. How do you navigate that? Well, it, uh, if I can give you a story to summarize the emerging market, uh, I, I am I'm currently a pessimist, but it's very difficult for me to be a pessimist because, I mean, I sit here, I made all my money in emerging markets, and here I come to tell people to vote no. You know, it's, uh, it's a little bizarre, you know, but to answer your question why I went to Europe, it's again to, to mediate the, the risk, you know. So if I can tell you a short story which summarizes my experience in the emerging market. In 2002, I went to Algeria, and I got a license, I bid for a mobile license, the first one, uh, for, and I put a price of $700 million. France Telecom was against me, and they put a price of $400 million. So everybody went out and said, this guy is, is not a risk taker, he's crazy, he doesn't know what he's doing, and he's overpaid, and so on. Anyhow, long story short, in five, uh, in five years, or se six years exactly, I, I built a company that was worth $15 billion out of this initial investment in seven years. That's the good news. The bad news is the, the Algerians, someone went to the Algerian president and told him, this guy is making $700 million net profit every year, and he just paid $700 million for the license. So how can this work, you know? They forgot to tell him about the five billion we invested in the infrastructure, you know? So the government decided that this is too good to be true, and they cracked down on the company, took the company. We were uh, thrown away with no compensation, and now we are in arbitration. So when people... <laughs> Sorry, sorry for my friend here, <laughs> but he has a fund, you know, he has to, <laughs> I, I'm talking from my experience. So when people tell you, you know, Please invest in the emerging market. market, you know, they need to understand what, what the, other, the other side of the story is that, okay, I mean, emerging market, here I am, I built this big successful company, $15 billion, but in a nutshell, in one night, it was gone. But that is the interesting dynamic, isn't it? That, that, well, <laughs> that... <laughs> I just have to add a caveat that it wasn't all gone. <laughs> okay, but no. this is the interesting dynamic, isn't it, between funds investing in emerging markets and companies investing huge amounts of money in infrastructure. But we have the funds' money. I mean, we are, I mean, we are, we are traded, we have bonds, we have shares, so most of these funds have our stock, so they take the loss with us, you know. I'll come back to that point in a minute, but I also want to include uh, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got such a bad experience. <laughs> Um, just to give everybody the opportunity to, to set the tone on this panel for where they think the emerging markets are going. South Africa, now that's an interesting one because also, obviously, it's hugely skewed towards the commodity space. That's your family's forte, but the labor problems there really are raising their ugly head. I think uh, talking about the South African example specifically, there, that, that's about a five-day conversation. And if you guys are comfortable and have your sleeping blankets and everything else, we can start. But more importantly than that, I think it really it's an understanding of, of risk and reward, and particularly how you go about creating relationships which can last forever. And uniquely, uh, the family through De Beers uh, got into partnership originally with the Tanzanian government back in the 50s, and then in Botswana more recently in the six, late 60s. And we have a series of experiences which are critically finding sustainable relationships between both society, the political establishments in countries, and business. And that brings a different perspective and a different set of interlinking relationships, which can, I believe, mitigate many of the risks that uh, high-growth countries experience. And it comes really around the backdrop of a lack of institutional capacity in most of these emerging countries, not for dint of anything other than that they're young. And where there is a lack of institutional capacity, the idea of relying on that institutional capacity to govern the relationship, a court, or a set of regulations, the likes, isn't possible. And so you have to default back into how interpersonal relationships are built. And those are built on trust. And I'm always reminded of the most amusing statement that we use as, as part of family law, and that was Kenneth Kaunda saying to my grandfather way back in the 1970s, shortly after he'd nationalized, similar experience to you, the copper belt in Zambia, and he turned to my grandfather and he said, Harry, you know, you're, li you're not like those people in the West. They do business first, and then they become friends, sometimes. Here in Africa, we become friends first, 
and then we do business. Mm. And I think the, the, the dialogue for me around emerging markets or, or high growth markets is how you build that kind of friendship, how you build the relationships that mitigate all these external factors which can totally dr and dramatically change your business overnight. But what do you do, as for instance, we see in this question here, what do you do if those friendships don't matter anymore because those people aren't in power anymore? It's not only friendships with political elite. Right. It's friendships with society and with community. If you look at what De Beers was able to achieve, say, in Botswana, we enabled um, free education to the age of 14 to 16 now, enabled free health care. We basically provided a mechanism for the government to take what was, at the discovery of diamonds, the poorest country in Africa, the poorest country in the world, to one which is firmly a middle-income country today. And actually, in statistical terms, somewhat differently, because it's a very small country, made Botswana certainly until about 2005 the fastest growing economy in the world over a period of 30 years. I think what we can see from this question here, which is really interesting, which is why I wanted to wait, the overwhelming response appeared to be yes initially to the que uh, answer to the question, would you invest in the Arab Spring affected countries today? And obviously, as the dust has settled, the more cautious people have voted. And as you can see, it's overwhelmingly no. <laughs> would you say, Arif, that that's something that you have to deal with as well? People I, I wouldn't asking have, for access, yeah. but not really thinking it through enough. So I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that statement either, because it's not all rosy, and you can't paint everything with the same brush. So in a sense, I, you know, uh, Nagib and I disagree on many issues and agree on many issues, but when you isolate it down to an individual country or an experience in a country, you're inevitably going to have negativity and positivity. What Jonathan said was very wise, which is that most people that operate across borders in these markets actually um, enable themselves to develop a corporate foreign policy. And so long as it's built on stakeholder engagement and sustainable business opportunity, you'll find that the way business is done in these markets is actually very different from the way it's done in the West. You have a simple set of rules, regulations here, you have bankruptcy laws, you have protections, and we go down that route. When we look at these markets, every one of them is different, but because the panel is about all markets, I feel I can generalize and say that if two-thirds of global growth is going to be coming from these markets, and these markets are growing at two or three times faster than developed markets. Look at where the wise investors are going. If you look at Coca-Cola, half of their global revenue is coming from these markets. Unilever is um, investing, now generating over 50% of their revenue from these markets. I'm glad you mentioned that, actually, because that is another strategy in the emerging market space now. Does one actually invest directly in that emerging market or invest in big international players that already have access to it anyway, like, for instance, Coca-Cola? Where would you stand? So McKinsey actually did a study on this and came out with a conclusion that companies that are domiciled in these markets are actually growing much faster in turn than these multinationals that are investing in. There is absolutely no substitute to local knowledge. And even the multinational companies that are coming in are understanding that they need to be local in these markets and they need to understand these markets dramatically more. And when I say that the opportunity is there, I also look at a very simple fact that actually bewilders me, but it's a reality. We're moving into an environment where more than half of mankind for the first time in its existence is becoming urban. And most of that urbanization is happening in these growth markets. And people are moving into cities in these markets at the rate of a million people a week. That's eight New York cities a year. And all of these cities need more of everything. They need infrastructure, they need real estate, they need consumer products. You talked earlier about um, a simple thing about Africa being a resources story. Africa oh. is actually a consumer product story. Yeah. It's a phenomenal consumer product story. The problem is a lot of people think of Africa as a recipient of aid. We need trade in Africa. We need investment in Africa. And once we start going down that route, you'll find that the opportunities that it gives up are phenomenal. You also need infrastructure in Africa and telecommunications <coughs> as well. And this brings me to you, uh, Nag Nagib Suiris. Let's turn the focus a little bit towards the Arab Spring states, because um, obviously that is something that has affected you. It's affected your business and the other diversified parts of your business that are run by your brother and your father. Your thoughts on where we're going today? I think the, the problem, I mean, uh, the good news is valuations are low. 
So if there are many assets for grabs, including some of ours, if anybody was interested. <laughs> uh, uh, because of the perception of, of the country, because of the reality in, uh, of the country. See, uh, I'm not uh, trying to pretend that I'm the capitalist with the conscious, but it's very, I would not advise uh, anybody to, to really invest um, uh, in a, I mean, I'm, I'm really, uh, uh, I'm contradicting myself now, so I will tell you where I'm contradicting myself. Uh, to invest in a country where you don't have uh, the rule of law and order or democracy and so on, because what we forget about the other problem is when we talk about Kenneth Kawenda, you talk about nationaliz na nationalizations, but it's coming from nationalism. But how about corruption? Yeah. Every second leader in Africa thinks that the country belongs to him. You know, I mean, if he, the railways is his, the mines are his, the, the licenses that he gives out are his, you know. So how do you deal with that, So though? when you have corruption, how can you uh, make friends with someone who's corrupt? How can you take someone's word when he's corrupt? See, that's a big challenge, you know, and uh, Africa has not completely has gone out. It has improved tremendously, and that is because of the world today and the transparency in the world, and because also... Some European organizations now are going after all these African rulers who have robbed their countries from everything. You know. But back to the Arab Spring, my point is, I would prefer nowadays, and that's why when you I just answer your question why you invested in Italy, because I felt at one time, Anton, this is too much risk. You know, I had to look, balance my risk, so I decided to take, uh, leverage my emerging market assets and put it in a safe place, Italy, if you can. At, the, <laughs> at that time. <laughs> <laughs> at that time, but I'm still very bullish about Italy. I mean, I, I, mean, I love Italy, so. But at that time, it was, uh, it was safe to do that, you know. Uh, uh, but today, you know, to say, okay, you want to invest in the Arab Spring, I mean, wh wh how can you invest uh, in Libya, for example, today when there is a civil war ongoing, or in, in, in Syria, or in, uh, in Tunisia, or even in, I mean, I don't want to talk about Egypt, but Egypt today also requires uh, the rule of law and order has to be clear. It has to have a democratic, a real democratic uh, environment. You know, so you, unless these two things are there, I would vote no. But Egypt used to attract the lion's share of foreign direct investment going to North Africa, and indeed Africa as a whole. Where is all that money going? If it can't legitimately go into Egypt no, because are, people are too concerned about getting access to the current system? I think today, uh, I mean, there are many countries in, in Africa who have developed a semi-democratic regime, who are encouraging investments. You know, I think countries like Ivory Coast, like Cameron, uh, even uh, in, in Sudan has a lot of potential. Even they're trying now to attract more investment south of Sudan. Many countries in Africa are prepared for, uh, for this. I think Tunisia will be eligible for investments in one year, so before Egypt, you know. I think Morocco is still a place to, to go now because, I mean, the, uh, Jordan could be... There are still some areas where you can invest semi-safely, you know. Which we're doing at present. Where's your preferred... So, that, you where know, would be your preferred when, country when, to invest when, in? When it's, I love your question because you say Arab Spring afflicted countries, right? It's like a virus. So, so the... <laughs> The reality, the reality is that when Mohammed Bouazizi burned himself, he did not do so to make a political statement. He did so from economic necessity. He could not feed his family. Now, what happened with Arab Spring countries is they became politically afflicted. And so whether you agree with the Brotherhood or disagree with it, whether you agree with what happened in Libya or not, the reality is that these countries went into turmoil. And this discussion is not a relevant place to talk about uh, political Islam, but that's really what is happening today. Within Egypt, we have a lot of businesses in Egypt. In fact, I sit on Orascom Construction's board. And yes, there are issues where the government is victimizing. I know you can't say it, but I'll say it. The government. No, no, no I can say it. Right, so I'll say it. <laughs> I'll say it even more clearly. The government is victimizing previously prosperous business people because they were uh, affected by what they considered to be a, um, another regime. But the real reality within Egypt is the economy is still in parts growing. We have businesses in Egypt, we have over a billion dollars invested there, and we see some of our businesses growing at 20 and 30%. 
Okay. Now, would I be putting new money into Egypt today? No, but then I similarly wouldn't be putting money into Syria or anywhere else. That comes to risk mitigation and sensible thinking. If a country is in turmoil, you don't do that. But there are so many other countries in the Middle East, countries like Saudi Arabia, countries like T Turkey, countries like Morocco, which are growing in leaps and bounds. And in fact, you've often said that it's the negative stories that gather all the headlines. That's right. And people can't differentiate and see the trends and the up-and-coming markets that are coming up, as you're saying, like Saudi Arabia, because of all the fog. And that's the quality of local presence. You can analyze and understand the difference and not paint everyone with the same brush. Jonathan, but, let me come to you. I mean, Nina, I think one of the really interesting aspects here for me is as you go into this from a Western perspective, the, the rules are so different when you come to these emerging or in high growth markets because you, you, w what are taken as constants in the West, the rule of law, the regulatory environment, etc., else, and you can literally tick them off and put them in a box and put them aside and concentrate on the financial ratio of this and the profit margin of that and the next thing, aren't in the world that we live in. So, if you can't get your head around going way beyond the conventional box that is taught at business schools today, you're going to fail. And that's why actually this is in a sense great for us because what it means is it leaves the playing field for people who understand this world more open and we can go out there and we can find the really good deals. And the reality is you don't want to do most of the deals out there because the guys are there, they know what's happening on the ground and they will take the gap. Because most businesses will take the gap if it's available, and the gap is much, much wider in, in, country, in continents like Africa and Middle East and in other emerging markets. But oh, the, in, sorry. I would say that we're almost slightly biased, though, here, because you have great family aid expertise in the world's emerging well, markets. That's why, that, that's why that I like emerging some, markets. I'm that, a great Exactly. Bull. That also some, some investors who are, for want of a better word, <coughs> new or ingenue to the market um, would not have. Would you say, from your position, though, that there is pressure upon companies to deliver growth, especially listed companies, and they might jump in too hastily to the world's emerging markets to deliver those growth figures on a quarterly basis? Absolutely, 100%. And again, it's all this about building relationships. How long does it, become, does it take you to get to a position where you have a trust between individuals? Six months. How long does it take to, become, to gain a point where there's a trust between institutions? Well, that's a matter of years. How can you make an investment without that level of trust? So ask, look at the timeline of, an, of a meaningful and sustainable and successful investment in, say, an African country, and you're looking at a period of 18 to 36 months just in the setup. How many people here would be prepared to put the legwork work in 18, 36 months for an investment which in the context of the sort of capital that rushes around the world will be relatively small. I think that's an important point because capital in today's world, in this globalized world, has no investment, has no boundary. Yeah. It goes to wherever the opportunity is. But it goes, but it goes too quickly. And then the relationship isn't there and when it falls down everyone says, oh, terrible headline. Africa is a disaster, this country, that country, this corruption, that corruption. And that's true, Arif. If you typically speak to anybody who's managing a fund, yeah. you'll say, what's your return? They'll say, what do you want, one year, six months, or three years? Sure. And obviously, that might not be long enough to do the investments you need in these markets. Well, you know, I, I live in the private equity world, and I live in these markets. I was born in these markets. I invest in these markets. And we've achieved excellent returns in these markets. Now, the, the, the way I look at it is preconceived notions have to be shared. So when we look at this broad spectrum, we have to follow trends. We have to understand what these markets represent. So for example, let's look at Africa. A decade ago, The Economist had a cover that said, the dark continent. Last year, The Economist had a cover that said Africa rising, okay? What's the difference? The difference is, as uh, Naguib said earlier, some countries are making the move towards governance, opportunities coming in, the consumer classes are growing, there are 300 million Africans in sub-Saharan Africa that are entering the middle classes, and therefore, the opportunity is phenomenal. Now, if you think about it, there are less credit cards in sub-Saharan Africa than there are in Italy. And I was thinking about how we can solve the problems of both countries by moving the credit cards there and letting them buy it. And it'll solve it Italy's problem take the too. debt with it as well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, it'll solve that. But there is more and more, if, if I take a country like Saudi Arabia, there was an oil price boom in the 1970s. 
And guess what happened? People started producing more children. There were industries that followed parallel paths. There were Procter & Gamble, Kimberly Clark, baby diapers, disposables. There was business trends that were happening. And today, those people are 45 years old. And guess what? Saudi Arabia is full of pharmacies and spectacle shops. Right? So if you, if you follow that trend in any country, anywhere, and go back to what I was saying about urbanization, about the demographic dividend of young people coming in, shed the preconceived notions that these places do not have access to human capital. There are more Africans going back to Africa. There are more Chinese going back to China. There are people going back to invest in their markets. And that's really where the biggest opportunities are going to come from. Uh, I've... Um personally um, followed the emerging market space for the best part of 10 years and, in fact, used to anchor a show on the subject. And what I love hearing from people in the emerging markets is the story of the rising consumer, the rising middle class. But the reality is, if it were so easy, well, obviously, um, people like Nagib Sawiris wouldn't have the stories that he has to tell us here on this podium today. Um, putting your money where your mouth is, uh, Nagib Sawiris, and making huge investments in infrastructure in these places, as we were saying before, only to see the regulatory framework become rather quixotic, that must be increasingly frustrating. No, we didn't put the money before the regulatory structure was there. But in, sometimes uh, it in changes. In most countries, uh, no, the, the problem is exactly that, that it is there, they put all the nice stuff, they give you all the nice promises, you put your money and then... <laughs> They, they, they change course, like Algeria, for example, again. They went into a course, we want to attract private uh, investments. They changed their laws. They issued a very good investment law, protecting investments. The regulatory environment was formed. The telecom regulator, very professional, was created. Success came. And suddenly, the government, the government had a, I mean, combined with corruption, of course, and, and the government sentiments of nationalism and trying to go back to socialism, decided to change the course between day and night. And that's what hits you without any preparation, because for years you've been investing under the pretext of a free economy and attraction of investment and investment protection treaties and all that stuff that thinks that you think gives you protection. And then between day and night, because these were autocriterian governments, dictatorial type of governments, they can change the rules between day and night and combined with some corruption, because you know, you have two types of businessmen: uh, businessmen that are practical and yield to corruption, and you have very rare businessmen that rather lose all what they have but go to bed at night and feel good about themselves. You really need to change your country selection criteria. <laughs> I was going to ask no, you. No, I think your... I need to change my character from the <laughs> from the very stubborn type of a character that doesn't yield to extortion to a more practical. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you about your country selection <clears throat> because what's really interesting is that your company actually owns seventy five percent of the main telecommunications mobile company in North Korea. Exactly. Yeah. That must be one of the most interesting governments to do business with. It's North Korea. North Korea, yes. North Korea, yes. Uh, I mean, it's not the most uh, difficult country to uh, do business with. There's no other examples, because I'm the only example. Well, exactly. <laughs> Does that take nerves of steel or...? I, I, just for the people here who don't know, I own the only mobile operator in North Korea. And it's correct, I have 75% of that operation. And I have two and a half million uh, subscribers today. So that was the example I mentioned when people say, well, this guy talks about democracy and rule of law and order, and he's going to invest in North Korea. <laughs> what a contradiction. You know. My defense is here is that if you all want to look at the Arab Spring and ask what sparked the Arab Spring and what helped it happen, it's this device here. That's the freedom device. That's the device which we all used on 25 January to interact on Twitter and on Facebook and plan for a revolution, you know. So I'm not saying that I went there to <laughs> plan a revolution, otherwise I'll get... <laughs> can I tell them... Can I tell them the COE story? Uh, oh. <laughs> can I tell them what you said at COE? In what? So now, he, was, he came to a conference that I organized uh, just four months before Arab Spring in Dubai. And he was sitting there on the panel, and he said, he was speaking to predominantly young people, empowering them, exciting them, and he said, rise up against your rulers and revolt. <laughs> well, obviously, if you've got the stomach to say that in Dubai. <laughs> no, you know, I said it because, you know, at that time, really, it was, the, it was very peculiar. It was 
I think it was like uh, autumn 2010, yes. three months ahead of these revolutions. I was at the same uh, you know, state of mind like all the young people of Egypt and the Arab world that we were totally, we had no more hope. These rulers were there 30, 40 years. We were unable to speak our mind. We were unable to speak freely. We didn't have free press. So no. how did you manage to build a business like Arascom, which is a world-renowned name, if the regime was so difficult to deal with? No, it's, uh, it's like, uh, I will tell you, I mean, uh, Egypt actually, to be just in defense, you know, the uh, Mubarak regime uh, was, uh, has done everything the right way, but always five or 10 years late. You know? So they created the environment for free investment. You know? I actually dare to say that the, this regime was one of the least corrupt regimes in the, in the region, when you take it in relative sense. You know, like, <laughs> if you compare them to Mobutu Sisiko or uh, Marcos from the Philippines or these guys, like, I mean, but uh, so the environment was there, you know, uh, the open door policy was there and we, we were able to, with a lot of difficulty, to, to work and invest and build the Orascom story. I mean, the, the thing is that it's difficult and very hard, but also the outcomes are uh, instrumental. I mean. Uh, uh, you know, I, like my company was $18 billion worth, where I started with a capital of $60 million in seven years. So the, the rewards are very high, the risks are very high, and the, and, the, and the effort you need to pull. My father has a very nice saying always. He says, if you make it in Egypt, you can make it anywhere. But, <laughs> but you know, Nagib, the problem is that we can, we can potentially hijack a discussion to focus on the negativity of certain markets, the reality is that you actually did incredibly well and made yeah, billions of yeah, dollars I agree with in all of these markets, and we can get obsessed. No, it's, but, but, but we are here to tell people is uh, what's, what, what are the risks and what are the gains? I mean, it's very high risk, but very high gain. It was like that, you know, a few years ago. I think it remains. I mean, even if you want, if you look, if you answer this question about the Arab Spring, if you go to Egypt today, there are like dozens of hotels and businesses that are totally underpriced mm -hmm. because the, the locals, many of the locals, on top of them like someone like me, is not comfortable with the current government, for example. So it's an opportunity for someone else who is non-political, who thinks uh, Egypt is a, uh, you know, will come back and so on. I want to broaden out the discussion to include China and Africa, the China and Africa relationship, and come to you here, Jonathan, because this is a very interesting dynamic we're seeing. We're sometimes seeing people plowing into the emerging markets from, say, Europe or the United States to get in on that trade, perhaps before it all gets mopped up by China. You must have a unique view of that being based there. Uh, I think, uh, firstly, I, I think in terms of China coming to Africa, there is a unique difference in the, the offer that China brings to Africa. And people often make, I think, an incorrect assumption that Africa can't think for itself individually and collectively. And so they say China is going to take over, China is going to recolonize, China or colonize, and China is going to somehow create the greater Chinese empire, including Africa. And Economically, they may have significant investments in Africa and have significant people presence in Africa. What they also have done is they've put an offer on the table, <coughs> excuse me, that to the Africans is it more attractive than the alternative offer. And what's really interesting is what is the fundamental difference in the Asian offer, if I can call it that, versus the Western offer. And the Asian offer is generally much more rooted in commercial outcome than the, Asia, the, the Western offer, which often comes with a series of conditionalities, which in some respect are hugely detrimental. And I'll, I'll just illustrate that with a, with a little vignette of an example. One of the common conditionalities of Western aid or investment into, into Africa is, is universality of the rule of law. Sounds great, everybody here would tick the box and say, yes, please. Let's just unpack what universality of the rule of law means in an African country. You have, sitting next to each other, two entities. One is a subsistent farmer, the other is a big investment business such as ours or a natural resource business which needs a certainty over a long period of time. The subsistent farmer has kicked off his land. 
Universality of rule of law, even in a very effective system, would result in maybe 12 to 18 month justice, because that's how long it takes to make it work. Well, he doesn't care because he's dead, he's starved to death. By contrast, if you start addressing the needs of that subsistent farmer, which is a very speedy form of justice, the big business who want to invest hundreds if not billions of dollars, needs long-term certainty and a process and a security around it. The two cannot coexist. So if you come as a Westerner and say, here's my money, but these are the conditions attached, what you're doing is setting up a distinct and inevitable failure mode and actually, as the government in an African country, you look at that and you say, thank you very much, I don't want that money. Mm. Aren't you already, though, being involved, heavily involved in the commodity space, though, intrinsically involved in a similar sort of dynamic with the Chinese economy now showing signs of cooling, that it needs less, fewer natural resources? <coughs> um, aren't you already, especially if you look at your company and your company's holdings, already part of that dynamic? Uh, in the cycle, perhaps, but the reality is the global population is growing, global consumer base is growing, and we're going to need more natural resource in the medium to long term. If you take a view which isn't quarter-based, annually-based, but instead take a 10, 15-year view, then I think so long as you position yourself in world-class resources and have the necessary relationships, and critically those relationships are not exclusively political, they are with the community as well, such that you can have what I like to call a social contract to operate and a political contract to operate geographically, then you can live through this cycle and you will make good money. Yeah. Okay. Just, uh, because I'm in national resources too now, by chance. <laughs> the, uh, people don't know that if you are going to go like into the mining business, from the day you identify a mine until you really produce an ore, it's five to seven years. Well, that's, that's quick. That's quick. So uh, when people talk about uh, that, imagine, you, imagine that this, seven, this specific mine production is needed in the world context of use. You're seven years without the resource because it takes seven years to get that resource out. So, uh, I mean, the, the problem with this business is that you need really uh, long sustainability I mean, in our telecom, I mean, I, I, I actually really would love to go back to my original business, which is the telecom. And when I went into resources, I said, oh, my God, I didn't know that. <laughs> Join the club. In telecom, after six months, we used to put the network and we hear the money coming in after six months, you know, because everybody takes their phone and the money starts coming in, you know. In this business, you know, you start working like for seven years until you feel the first output. So if you're like an impatient person like me, who likes to see fast success, you know, it's not really, uh, so, so you shouldn't worry about that business being not needed and so because the, the time it takes is very long and with a lot of disruptions because let's say you sign a mining uh, uh, agreement with one government, uh, uh, within seven years in, in Africa with the coup d'etats and all these changes, you know, you're out for three governments in between. Speaking of patience, our audience has been very patient, and I'm sure a lot of them have questions for you. Let me start by taking two or three questions. Can I ask you to identify yourselves, obviously, and also say who you're directing your questions to on the panel? Um, <coughs> first man over there with the striped tie and his hand up. Okay, so let's see whether we have a microphone for the gentleman here in the front. A microphone's just coming for you behind there. Good morning. Thank you for the panel. It was a very interesting debate. Uh, I'm a little bit worried about what I listen here. I listen kind of like a selfish uh, way of thinking, uh, backwards, I would say, because now we're in different times. I hear you saying, oh, I want to go to this uh, country to invest and to see what I can get but I don't hear anything about what I can give to these countries. And I think this is extremely important. You have such an enormous power to make a change in these countries. And if you don't do so, you're not only affecting the country itself, but you're affecting your investments. As you said, uh, for example, what happened to you is the classic example. In a country where the people are not empowered, then the terrorists become in power, and then they can do what they did to your company, right? So how to avoid that, how to think further and be more responsible in the communities you work with? 
I would like to hear your thoughts about it. Thank you. Okay, we'll take that question first. Let's take a, a, another question. There's a gentleman over there, a hand in the back. Thank you. I don't loudly. think it's turned on. Just say it and I'll, uh, I'll paraphrase for the audience who can't hear. Uh, I mean, I just wanted to go back because in talking about the emerging markets, it's just like it's always new and we are, let's call it, worry about it. But just to go back in history, so that in the 1800s, for example, there was this famous Scot, MacGregor, Gregor MacGregor actually, who went to the London market and he says, oh yeah, by the way, I had this great invention of the city with a bourgeois uh, republic and I have the control and he starts showing all these different things. And to some extent, at times, it seems like in the financial press, and especially in media, we get a lot of that. So how do you talk to these kind of things, you know? Like, how do you tell how to do uh, whether there's an actual investment opportunity or whether there is, there is not, uh, besides obviously having people on the ground and how to tell out what the real returns are for these and for the consumers as well of these financial instruments. Okay, thank you. And then one final question here in the front. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Andre Roman. I am a PhD student uh, in government at Harvard University. And I would like to ask a question about political regimes. Um, I think one of the insights that we heard through, through your discussion is that sometimes, at least, a benevolent authoritarian regime with a, an efficient bu uh, bureaucracy um, and one that brings stability to a nation uh, can be preferable for development uh, to a, an unstable democracy, one that is polarized and fragmented. Um, and if that is the case, then I would like to ask you as business leaders, if you support democracy as a, as, as a matter of principle, or if sometimes you believe that actually keeping an authoritarian re regime live, live for longer can actually be, be preferable for development and for a, for a safer transition later on. Um, and in particular, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Sawiris, about his experience with transition in Egypt. You declared yourself a supporter of the Arab Spring, and I believe that you're a supporter of the Arab Spring. But obviously now, <laughs> I don't think it looks exactly as you expected it afterwards, right? Egypt is uh, divided, economic growth uh, has plummeted, uh, th there's a lot of violence, and your businesses have probably suffered considerably. Looking back, would you have been as enthusiastic about um, the transition to democracy as you were. Thank you very much. Okay, let's, let's start with that last question first. And I might say I'm quite comforted to see that it's largely young people and students here who are the first to ask questions because obviously the emerging markets or high growth markets Thank as you. you've now rebaptized them, Arif, um, are to a certain extent the promise of the future. Let's start with that final question for you, Nagib. Um, the German foreign minister was saying at dinner last night, not every country around the world shares the Enlightenment values and the same definition of democracy. It's easy to answer the question. You know, imagine someone uh, stole your house. Then you went into this house and took the thief out. The problem is another thief went in. <laughs> <laughs> it's still your house. You still have to defend it. We made one revolution. Maybe we need to do a second revolution. Because one, when we all really supported this revolution, and me, I mean, I, I'm considered in my family and in my country as the, as the crazy businessman who takes crazy risks, because I stood with the revolution during Mubarak, which means that if Mubarak would have stayed, I would have been in jail right now. And all my assets in Egypt would have been confiscated. You see? But we went out because we believe in freedom, in democracy. We believe that in this part of the world, we are entitled to the same democracy you have here in the West. It's not too much to ask. You know? So if someone came in and robbed this from us, like the current situation in Egypt, you, you've ex you have been re actually polite about describing the situation now in Egypt. You know? It's worse than what you said. And uh, we will fight back. You know? We will not surrender a great country like Egypt uh, in, back into the darkness, back into dictatorships, or 
back into uh, a non-democratic uh, situation. As far as the question on the human side, you know, you need to understand that, and I'm being blunt about it, you know, we are businessmen, we are entrepreneurs, we are investors. We're not a charitable organization. You know, that's a different story. Having said so, you can choose whether you have a conscience or not. So it's personal in the end, you know. So like me, I have a conscience. When I go to the South, uh, to Sudan or to Ivory Coast, I always look at the human aspect. I look, what kind of, what can I do in this country that people will remember me for doing a good and not just grabbing some money or making some money. But what I'm very careful about is like people, when they try to portray that we are uh, you know, I, even in telecom conferences, I used to go out and tell them I, when we have technocrats, the CEOs of RNC or Vodafone, and they will talk about new technologies. And me, I would always come and tell them, listen, guys, I'm only in for the money. I don't care what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't care what we're providing here. I just went into that business because it makes a lot of money, you know. So, Your views on that? Yeah, so I will continue to disagree with Nagib. And it's just surprising we're such good friends. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I loved your question, actually, because, you know, the, the way to demonstrate a model is to show how you do it yourself. And there are businesses that believe very strongly in stakeholder engagement. I know you said the same thing, Jonathan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our business is predicated on stakeholder engagement. We operate across 36 different markets around the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, and the Southern Hemisphere has more South-South trade today than North-South trade, which means that we tend to understand and work through the markets that we're living in. In our business, from the day we started, we put 5% of our top line, not our bottom line, into engagement with communities. Why did we do that? Not because we're an NGO and not because we don't want to make money, but we believe that stakeholder engagement leads to identifying sustainable businesses. Sustainable businesses lead to good business practices, and good business practices lead to profit. Okay? So that is a given uh, baseline of the way I and my colleagues do our business. And why is it so important to us? I'll give you a small example. Um, we operate a utility company in, in, in Pakistan. 18 million people in that city, in the, uh, in the city where we operate this utility. And on top of that, it's a monopoly on transmission distribution generation. When we acquired it, it was a failed privatization. And it was a business that if you had employed the best consultants in the world, you couldn't have designed a better broken company. Why did we go into it? Why did we go into it? Because we said we'll make the money because we were buying it at a million dollars a megawatt. A thousand megawatts, a billion dollars. Simple math. But the real reality was if you could change that and go from a company that was experiencing 18 hours of load shed a day, reduce that, you can change the economy, you can change the way people think. In the course of doing that, we identified that that city had the largest cattle colony in the world inside an urban environment. We set up the world's largest biogas plant that produces electricity and powers the rickshaws so it removes the kerosene and produces organic fertilizer. We didn't need to do that. But by doing that, we changed the mentality of the consumer to say this company cares. This is one example. I can give you another hundred. But the more you engage with communities, the more you give people respect, the faster your route to profitability will be. Jonathan, how do you avoid that selfish gene, if you like, from showing its face? And then I'd also like you, like you to answer the question that was posed there on that side of the room, which, for those who couldn't hear it, essentially, if I got it right, um, was, is the emerging market really a new thing? Surely we've seen markets like, for instance, Europe after the Second World War behave like emerging markets. Is it not just a cycle? I, uh, Lots of, lots of different questions and, and fundamentally really two answers. In terms of democracy, the idea of community I totally support and community representation. Through a conventional democratic process, I think the jury is out. Um, I look at the Western democratic model and I can see certain things in it which I don't like. I can look at other democratic or pseudo-democratic models where I do see things that I like and I think we need to think about actually a new paradigm in terms of how do we get community representation. And that leads really to the second part and to, uh, in a sense, the first question that was asked about contribution back. And that is if you don't have 
a sustainable co social contract to operate, political contract to operate. You cannot exist in the medium to long term in, a, in an environment where there aren't ruthless regulations to hold your legitimacy. In the West, you have that ruthless regulation. You have a 100-year history of the rule of law. You have bankruptcy protections. You have protections for the corporate entity. There is a weight. How many of you here are lawyers? Before I embarrass myself wholly. Nobody's putting up their hands. There has Nobody to be a lawyer in the room. <laughs> anyway, but the legal profession has made itself indispensable to the way the Western business works. In emerging countries, those institutions just don't have the robustness, don't have the strength to be able to allow corporates to act within a set of, of, of defined paradigms, defined rules. Instead, in Africa or any high growth market, emerging market where there isn't that sort of institution, you have to build a relationship so that you can operate. And that relationship reaches into the community, that relationship reaches into the political structures, otherwise you get nationalized. And that, in turn, leads to a, a virtuous circle of reinforcing and uplifting and then creating a new market for yourself because you bring consumers in because everybody's more prosperous. And to just sort of put a little full stop on the end of that, interestingly, in 1954, my great-grandfather said in an Anglo-American, which he, he had founded and, and was chairman of, uh, annual statement, we're here to make a profit, problems to your concern. But then he caveated it, a profit in such a way as to benefit the peoples and communities with whom we operate. And I still haven't found a better description of the triple bottom line. In terms of emerging markets, my fundamental view is if you're afar and you don't know what you're investing in, you're a fool. So an emerging market is frankly a market which you have to go and visit, you have to get to know, and then you can make money in it. You can't sit in New York yes. and pour the money over the fence and hope to God that it's going to work. It might work for the first six months, but not for the first six years. And it may work in certain strategies, but not in all strategies. If you're going to invest into markets, you need to be in the markets. Well, I'm glad we touched on investing in the markets, and particularly the emerging markets from afar, because I want to now ask you to vote on our second question of the day, and it is very apt, given what you've just said, Jonathan. Is it still financially rewarding to invest in the world's emerging markets? So if we can... Change that live voting panel, please, to the second question. Can I influence the outcome before they answer it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that in the financial world you're not allowed to do that, <laughs> even in the emerging markets. Now, um, when we get a chance to put that question up, I'd like to ask you to vote on that, because that would very much help to crystallise our, our thoughts on, on what we've said today. Um, I do want to ask you as well, um, Arif, about the, just going back to the whole intra-emerging markets trade, mm. you're an interesting one because obviously you're based out in the Middle East. Would you classify yourself as, say, a Western company investing in the emerging markets or an intra-emerging market trade now? So, so we have six hubs. We're not just based in the Middle East. We're based in Latin America. We're based in Africa and Southeast Asia and so on. Now, we do treat ourselves as being a clear example of governance and transparency and quality. So we apply the best practices that we can find from around the world. We voluntarily went and got ourselves regulated, um, and the private equity industry is not known for that. But what we did is we said we need to be whiter than white because we're starting a new industry in these markets. We were in the vanguard of that industry starting uh, back in the day. So. For us, it's very important that we do things right. It's very important to measure risk. But somebody in the earlier panel said something very interesting, which is risk is all about self-regulation as well, right? And, and if you do that right, then you create an organization that has it embedded in its values. If you don't, then you have an outcome, which I remember Joe Ackerman said once in, and I, I, I told you I'd bring it up. In 2008, we were on a panel, 2009, and he was a big proponent in regulating, in enhancing regulation. And he said, our biggest issue is that we're all guilty of greed. We've been guilty of greed for the last 10 years, and that is something that you can't regulate away, even with self-regulation. But that's not answering the question. It Are you an emerging market? Do you market yourselves as an emerging market fund with local expertise, or do you market yourself as to people who you're raising funds for, for your private equity investments, as, say, like another, I don't know, Apex partner, but just with a special 
investment focus on the emerging market? I don't, well, I didn't answer it because I don't think people particularly want to hear about just my company, but if you insist on me doing that, I hate talking about ourselves, but the reality is that we operate on a footprint that is across all these markets, and we do it to best-in-class standards. So to the investors, they will never give us money if we don't have those best-in-class standards, but we operate in global growth markets. We have a presence in every one of them, and that's what investors want. Yeah, obviously, the reason why I mention this is because if you're a completely emerging market play, um, it gives people a different idea of the risk-reward basis. Let's have a look at um, how that question has come out. Is it still financially rewarding to invest in the emerging markets? Overwhelmingly, at the moment, it seems yes, and that is a vote that hasn't changed. So um, I'd like to uh, thank our panelists, and before we go, I would like to uh, put them on the spot each and ask them for three top emerging markets and the two risks going forward. And just a few words, starting out with you, Arif. Oh, Your top picks, the um, real risks. Well, like I said, we're in 36 markets. So we are there because we think that the opportunity is there. In South America, I prefer investing in Peru, Colombia, Chile, and Mexico than I do in Brazil. Because the simple reason that Brazil is over-regulated, it's ego-driven, too much money chasing too many deals. That's where I invest. In sub-Saharan Africa, today, almost anything you do in the consumer product space and in the logistics space is going to make you money, and I'm not going to go country by country. Indonesia is a country all about infrastructure opportunity and resources. Malaysia is an ignored country where, pending the outcome of elections, I think it will do very well. In India, the Indian businessman has not yet finished getting rich. So it's very difficult <laughs> for foreign investors to make money. <laughs> okay, but when you look across that board and you ask me where is that opportunity, I continue to say the markets I just said, countries like Turkey, phenomenal. So disagreeing with Naguib on the bad elements within our markets, I'm not going to invest in Yemen, and no, I'm not going to invest in Algeria, but you're a very brave man, you did. But the markets that I can outline are markets where people are making 20, 30, 40% returns. Naguib, why would you be courageous enough to invest top three picks? And what worries you the most, regulation, politics? It's, uh, you, it's a question of timing. If your question is about now? Now. Uh, nowhere. <laughs> right, that's a brief answer. <laughs> no, I would say right now I would only invest in Sub-Sahara, Africa. I would invest in Sudan, south of Sudan. I would uh, start looking at Tunisia. Uh, I would also, I, would, I don't mind uh, uh, investing in, uh, in Nigeria uh, right now, you know, though there's this uh, sectic, uh, sectary, I mean, uh, religious stuff going on. But um, I, I prefer nowadays to, to put my criteria as follows. Wherever there is a government that is clean and transparent and there is no corruption, Wherever, whenever there is a government that is democratic and has come to, to, the, to govern in a democratic uh, manner, uh, that's where I want to go right now because I'm sick and tired from all the, my past experiences, you know. I mean, bravery is nice when it works well, but when it works bad, <laughs> it tastes very bad, you know. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, this Algerian experience has shattered my dream, you know. My dream was to create one of the largest telcos in the world, you know, and because they destroyed that uh, Algerian, uh, as it was a very big component, so it destroyed my dream. So I'm very careful nowadays. Jonathan? It's a, it's a difficult one. It would be much easier to say where I didn't want to invest. And I think in some respects... Sure, that would get a longer uh, answer, I, wouldn't it? It's a longer answer, but it's interesting because actually thinking about the negative is perhaps more interesting than thinking about the positive. The, the positive self-select. I mean, I could have the same answers as everybody else, and we all have a list. But particularly interesting is looking at where, critically, you can build these long-term relationships. And where can you build them? Well, Botswana was a country where De Beers certainly has and continues to have a long-term relationship. I believe that Mozambique is on the up and up in my own sort of domestic patch. Angola looks interesting. Nigeria, to me, is an interesting one away from the oil sector. Uh, I know Africa better than most, but I would also argue that uh, emerging countries in the Middle East and also in Eastern Europe are, are very interesting. And, and so <laughs> we, can, we, can, we can spend a lot of time finding a lot of opportunities, but again, it will be determined by the asset and the relationships you can have. Unilever as a group is one of the largest consumer product companies in the world, 
19 out of the 20 factories it's building today are in global growth markets. Yeah, you mentioned that before. Um, I'd like to thank our guests here. Um, <laughs> you got it. I right? get your point. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank our guests here, though, for a, a, what was billed as a lively and informative debate. It certainly was. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, and. I think what we've learned from the upshot also of these two sessions of live voting is that, yes, overwhelmingly, people do want to invest in the emerging markets, but obviously the risky yeah, ones, such as, for instance, the Arab Spring, affected, not afflicted countries, um, present far more risks as well for people to contemplate, and so the vote was split on that. Thank you very much, gentlemen, you. for being here today.